In this uh, video, I'm going to be talking about the uh, letter of Pliny the Younger to his friend and fellow senator Calpurnius Mesa, who may also have originated from the same area as Pliny in northern Italy around uh, what is now Lake Como. Uh, it was called Comum in antiquity. Um, and Pliny the Younger, uh, the younger in distinction or contrast to his uncle Pliny the Elder, the great uh, philosopher, the man who is best known for dying in the uh, eruption of Vesuvius, Pliny the Younger um, lived from about AD 61 to AD 113, so if you say around to uh, 100 AD you, you'd be in the ballpark there, or the end of the first century, beginning of the second century AD. Um, he is most famous for his um, correspondence so he wrote a great deal and he published those letters and I think he had, you know, the idea when he was writing them that they were for publication. So do not think that these are little notes written to uh, friends, uh, even if they are to friends, but many of them are to important people, in fact, including the emperor. Um, uh, even if they concern gossip or tittle-tattle or personal opinion, they are works that are prepared for publication and they therefore have literary tropes and uh, a knowledge about them that they are for public consumption. Um, in this particular uh, letter, we're going to uh, find out about an extraordinary action by a woman, uh, a woman who is nameless in this story, as is her husband, but she is being used, I think, as a form of sort of moral philosophy to show that uh, we can learn from the great deeds of even ordinary people how to live our lives. So there is a moralising purpose to this story. So the Latin is quite uh, direct and in some ways um, quite chatty. We start off with, uh, I was sailing, now we go bam, um, through, across, pair, um, our Larius, um, our, across Lake um, Larius, now Lake Como. The nostrum there has been understood as saying, well, you know, we both come from this area, so it's our lake. So it's a kind of conversational gambit here to make the, the letter um, personal, I suppose. When a friend, cum amicus, uh, pointed out to me, showed to me, ostended me, uh, mihi, a willam, uh, a villa, and uh, etiam, and even, etiam can mean also, but here I think even is better, even a bedroom, a cubiculum, quod in lacum promenade, which uh, was built out uh, over the lake or into the lake. Okay, so cubiculum, we're going to have a story which is very, very personal. It's about the relations between a dying man and his wife, and he's dying in his bedroom, and the cubiculum is the, is the setting for that. So that's just laying um, out the stage. Now it's built, this bedroom is built over the lake, it's clearly, you know, a luxurious villa, it's got the lake views, people now want to look over uh, uh, Lake Como, but it's also important to know that it, the bedroom goes out over the lake because of what's going to happen at the end. So the cubiculum cord in Lacan Promenade is setting up the, um, the intimacy of what's going to happen, but also the means by which everything is going to happen. Okay. Ex hoc. From this, the hoc, the bedroom, he said, uh, and we don't hear who the he is, it's just a friend. The friend isn't important. What's important is the actions. Uh, 
quite am feminine, a certain woman, a woman, we would say, once, Olim, once upon a time, once, so, you know, no real details of names, no details of time, did it actually happen, who knows, but even if it did happen, it's become a story that is used to, to model a moral or a model correct behaviour. It's the action that's more important even than the actors in this story. She, say uh, prekipitawit, she uh, threw herself down and the say is that herself, kum marito, with her husband. So there we are. There are the actors, a woman and her husband, and they threw themselves out of this bedroom. Now, the maritus, the husband, ex diutino for a very long time, and that it's not uh, diu just for a long time, the eno ending on the end of that is emphasising for how long he'd been ill. Um, putresque, back, a great word. He was becoming putrid, he was rotting. Uh, uh, well, they put here wasting away um, uh, with ulcers. The morbo uh, for a long time with an illness, ablative with an illness, was rotting uh, with ulcers. I mean, goodness me, what a what a terrible, horrible way to die! And notice how uh, quickly and easily it's it's framed. It's very vivid. Now, it's not here in the text, but um, actually they took the text, they took the words out for the GCSE, but uh, he implies that the poor man has got some nasty sexually transmitted disease and he's, he's dying with the ulcers and the pus and the blood from all of that. So it's a pretty horrible way to die and, you know, a Christian or uh, a monotheistic a way might say well he's dying as a result of his own actions that kind of thing and once you have that in the background you kind of think that what the wife does is uh, even more amazing actually anyway we've got the pity coming up there from the imperfect putresque bat he was becoming rotten ex duty you know uh, from a, a long a lengthy morbo disease with ulcers you've got morbo ulceribus putresque bat all next to each other three words there and the, the juxtaposition of those words make it pretty pretty nasty well the wife the uxor his wife exig exagit and they've made it here insisted that uh insist insisted on uh, inspecting his body looking closely at his body so uh, a couple of things i want to say here uxor um notice she was a femina before uh, and he was the maritus, he wasn't a man, he was a husband, husband. Now she's the wife, and this is really important. And his wife insisted on looking at his body. So she's wealthy, she's got doctors, she's got slaves to do all the, the daily bodily care, just to remind us that she wouldn't be nursing him here. So she's actually gone beyond what she would have to do as an upper-class wife. She's, no, I've, she's demanded to look at that body and see what's actually going on for herself. So she has become an independent actor in this story. Um, and I think the inspicorate exegit, exegit, however you want to pronounce it, um, we've got some assonance going on there with the vowel sounds, putting that all together. Okay, so she wants to have a look at his body. Now she does this because he's being looked after by, I think, professionals. And the key word here is Fidelius. For she said, there's no word for she said, so it's there in the in the square brackets. For she said, no one, neque uh, quem quam, ne quem quam, no one uh, would tell him, uh, no one would indicate uh, uh, more truthfully, Fidelius, the more faithfully, the um, comparative form there, um, would be an indicator of whether num poset he would be able sanari to be healed so for she said no one will tell him more truthfully whether he could be cured so what this is um uh, indicative of is the fact that doctors who were being paid to look after someone obviously were very loath to say oh i don't think you can be healed because they would lose their job and not be paid so there would be no reason 
for them to say that. They would stay on saying, oh yes, you know, carry on paying me and I'll try and, and, and heal you. Um, but she says, no, you know, I, I, want, I want to see what's really happening here. So she has this um, intellectual and I, impetus and financial authority, I think, here to say, listen up, you've got yourself into this state. I think that's probably what's going on here. And doctors are just going to keep mollycoddling you and I'm going to tell you what's really happening here. Uh, and then we have the widget. She looked desperate. She despaired. She encouraged him, encouraged him, Hortata est, ut morerato, that he should die, in order to die. She, she encouraged him to die. Notice we've got a tricolon, a syndeton, there's no connectives between those three verbs, with it, despera, with hortata est. She looks, she sums everything up, she gives up hope, despera, with, and then immediately she encourages him to die. And wow, three words, three verbs, that a tricolon of verbs is always used to describe someone of action. So she's acting like a man here in that she makes a conclusion, she makes a decision and she decides to act. And now then we get the morerator and the mortis. It's all going to be about death. You can see that we've got um, polyptoton of, ver of a noun and a verb about death. Uh, she encouraged him to die and she herself um, ipsa uh, come, she was a companion, and I love that that word companion. It has a kind of military sense in it here. It's a, it's not something that a woman can just do. It's something that men do as well. A companion in death, mortis, and and then Pliny says actually he's not just his companion, dux imo. In fact, he's leader. I think that's terrific. What a woman, and very unfeminine. She is acting like a Roman woman. There's an, there's an interesting sort of side trope in Latin literature that has Roman women, although they're weak and they're women, they're better than other women. So Roman women can act like Romans and they can become leaders and they are better than their gender because by the very fact that they are Roman. So she becomes a leader and then we have this, um, she became a uh, Leader et et, both and his um, exemplum. Now, exemplum is a word that's used for moral examples. So this is where we get the moral philosophy language coming out in, in this little uh, letter. And uh, she was, for it, she was also his necessitas, the thing that was necessary to him to fulfil what he had to do. They translated it as compulsion here, and yeah, you could have that in the case of the compulsion, but because of the physicality of what um, uh, is going to happen, he can't do that without her. So not just his compulsion, but actually the very means, I might translate it as means by which he, he, he does this, this thing. For she um, uh, tied Ligawit herself, say, cum marita with her husband. We've had three, we've had the maritus word three times here. We've got a tricolon of that in this little letter. And she threw herself down, uh, abiekit, into the lake. Lacum. Look at the, the L sounds, the liquid sounds of ligo, to tie, and lacus, lake. And very, very quick ending with this. Um, the letter, the, the story ends quickly because she acted quickly and it was a quick death for them both. They both drown in the lake. And so it's a kind of a circular composition as well. We go, they've got that word lacum, uh, the final word, which relates back to the um, uh, mention of the lake at the beginning of this little story. And uh, we've got the two verbs, ligawit ab coming bang, she tied and she threw herself, threw herself down straight away into the lake. So they are out of position. The in lacum is what is used to emphasize the uh, dreadful uh, ending for the pair of them. But this ending is seen as something incredibly positive. So what sort of personalized response do you have to this? Do you think she's acting like an incredibly brave Roman? in committing suicide. Suicide was the great option for Romans. Or do you think she's kind of been 
um, pushed into believing that there's no life without her husband. Um, and that's why she's choosing to die with him. And she can't just push him out of the window. That would be that would be murder. But she can is she being the absolute ideal wife in sacrificing herself for the greater good of the death of her husband from this terrible disease? Or is she does she not have any self esteem and she thinks there is no life without her husband? Um, that's for you to think about and for you to consider. Um, but you must remember that for Pliny and his authors, she was acting in many ways like better than her sex, better than her gender. She was acting like a Roman man, quick to decision, quick to action, and giving her husband an honourable death. And re realising that she, as a woman, doesn't have much to do in life when her husband's gone. So think about those and come up with a personal response to this startling little story.